Doesn't it feel good to be picked for something, to be chosen? <laughs> I remember as a kid, Columbia Records picked me. They singled me out to be the recipient of 12 vinyl records for only a penny. And all I had to do was order eight more in the next year at a very inflated price. I remember getting called on the phone once and I was chosen to take part in a survey. Me, I was chosen, thank you. And I could not even tell you how many times various credit card companies have chosen me to receive their credit card. And get this, I didn't even apply. They reached out to me. Well, as Christians, we use this same language, that we are chosen by God. And, and that's a way better thing than a record club or a credit card. In our last study on Romans chapter 8, Paul is going to talk about what it's like to be chosen. Starting at verse 28, he says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is going to be fun. <laughs> this is going to be fun because we get to talk about what it means to be chosen. We get to talk about what it means to be elected, as the Bible says. Now, there are two basic understandings in the Bible of what this means to be chosen. And much of the argument circles around that word elected or uh, election. Now, first, I think you and I, when we think of elected, right, that means you decide to try to get some position with an organization or a government, and then that's all dependent on you getting enough votes to win. Now, in our community, we had an election for CIA members, and then last Tuesday, we had an election to decide the fate of 14 constitutional amendments that were put into effect by state lawmakers. But that's not what the Bible means when it uses the word elected or election. A better way for us to understand elected would be our word chosen. But again, who chooses? Does God choose? Do, do we? Do we have a choice? And, and where does free will play into all of this? So now we're going to learn another super big Bible study theology word. Soteriology. Soteriology is the study of how God saves us. And lucky us, this is probably one of the biggest arguments within the church. It's also one of the hardest to understand. I'll try to make it as easy as possible for you. And of course, as always, we will use slides. <laughs> there are two basic understandings within Christianity, Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism is named for John Calvin. He's a French theologian who lived from 1509 to 1564. Armenianism is named for Jacobus Arminius. He was a Dutch theologian who lived from 1560 to 1609. Both systems can be summarized with five points. Point number one, Calvinism holds to the total depravity of man, while Armenianism holds to partial depravity. See, aren't we glad that we're all on the same page? 
<laughs> what that means is Calvinism's doctrine of total depravity states that every aspect of humanity is corrupted by sin. Therefore, human beings are unable to come to God on their own. In other words, we're so bad we can't even choose God by ourselves. Partial depravity says that every aspect of humanity is also corrupted by sin, but not to the point that human beings are unable to place their faith in God. I mean, yes, we're bad, but we're not so bad that we can't choose God on our own. In general, Armenians believe there is this intermediate place between total depravity and salvation, and it's possible, by grace, for the sinner to choose salvation. Point number two. Calvinism says that election is unconditional, while Arminianism believes in conditional election. Unconditional election says that God chooses who will be saved based entirely on his will, not on anything within us. Conditional election says that God chooses who will be saved based on his foreknowledge of who will believe in Christ. In other words, God knows the future, so obviously he knows who will be saved. Point number three, Calvinism sees the atonement as limited, while Arminianism sees it as unlimited. Now, limited atonement is the belief that Jesus died only for the saved. Unlimited atonement is the belief that Jesus died for the world, but that his death is not in effect until a person receives him by faith. I know it's a lot to take in. I get it. Good news is we're not going to have a test. Point number four. Calvinism includes the belief that God's grace is irresistible, while Arminianism says that an individual can resist the grace of God. What does that mean? Irresistible grace says that when God calls a person to salvation, that person cannot resist. They have to become a Christian. They can't say no. Resistible grace says that God calls us to salvation, but that many people resist and reject this call all on their own. They have the power to refuse God. Point number five, Calvinism holds to perseverance of the saints while Arminianism holds to conditional salvation. Perseverance of the saints says that a person who is saved by God will always be a Christian. They cannot lose their salvation ever. Once saved, always saved. Conditional salvation is the view that a Christian can, of their own free will, walk away, that they can turn their back on salvation. So, in the Calvinism versus Arminianism debate, who's correct? Which one's right? Well, first of all, there are people on both camps, both sides, who believe all five points. And there are people on both sides who don't believe all five points. And there are people on both sides who believe a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So, in the end, neither system can be 100% right or 100% wrong. When there is such a massive divide on human opinion like this, then we have to say, then it's gotta be us. There's, it's human error. We don't understand. It's, it's not God's fault, it's not scripture's fault. The concept of who is elected and who is saved is obviously a concept that is just too big for us to grasp. Then it's, you know, it's, it's only for God to understand. What do we know for sure? Well, we know that God is absolutely sovereign, and he knows all, and he also knows who will be saved, and he knows each one who will be saved. And yes, human beings are also called to make a decision of faith, because we each have free will. Now, those two facts, they seem contradictory to us, but to the scriptures and to God, they make perfect sense. So whichever you decide, whichever you believe, whether even if it's a combination of beliefs, the fact still remains. The Bible says you are chosen. Going back to Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You know, earlier I was saying, it always feels good to be chosen by our peers. You know, maybe you were chosen to be a platoon leader. 
Maybe you were chosen to be the leader of your local women's group or your rotary or your PTA or someone nominated you or recognized you with an award. In, in a way, even our spouse chooses us and it feels good to be chosen. But what does it mean to be chosen by God, the creator of the universe? There are some attributes and blessings to being chosen. A few weeks ago, we said we are adopted children of God. That's an incredible thought right there. Co-heirs with Christ, not just children, but royalty. God saw us, wanted us, and then he adopted us into his family. We are joint heirs, sons and daughters of the King of Kings, and we have all the rights, responsibilities, and privileges that go along with that. And Paul says in verse 30, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. He called you. First and foremost, it says he called you. Verse Peter 2 says something similar as our Romans passage. It says, you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Every Christian is called by God for a specific purpose. And along the way, as we go, as we grow, there are many other callings on our life. There is a call to repent and be saved. There's the call to follow God's commandments. There's the call to be baptized. There's the call to be in a right relationship with God. There's the call to be holy, to, 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 to love God and to love others. With, those are all calls from God. There's this call to leave behind, you know, your old habits and your old attributes and your old hangups, all the things that mess up your life. And and, and you you leave behind all the things that you know are wrong. This call to be holy is to live a life now that brings glory and honor to God. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. The call to holiness is to live a changed life, a new life, a born again life, a spirit filled life. In Acts 2.38, Peter says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are also called to service. You know, if you're a Christian this morning, you have been called to serve God. God has saved you to serve him. Serving does not save you. Christ's sacrifice on the cross saved you, but your service to God is your response to his love and mercy and kindness. This call to service is the call to grow in Jesus, and and this chance to offer something of yourself to the one who gave his whole self. For you, you are called to serve Jesus because he served. He is the servant king, and we are called to come alongside him and build his kingdom, just like the disciples on the beach. You know, every day, in different ways, God places that call on your heart. He walks up and says, follow me. Second attribute, It says that he justified you. What does that mean? Well, justified means that you're marked good or that you're legitimate. It means you are made innocent. The Bible says that the punishment of sin is death and Satan knows that and he's read your file and there's nothing you can do to get out of it. There's no community service you can do. There's no fancy Hollywood lawyer that can save you. But Romans 8 says that God made us innocent through the cross of Christ. That's what justified means. There's a great story in the Bible in Zechariah chapter 3 that I think sums this up perfectly. It's about 520 BC, 70 years prior, Israel and Judah were conquered by Babylon and all the survivors were taken 700 miles away to uh, what is now modern day Iraq. And toward the end of that 70 years, Babylon is conquered by Persia, which is now modern day Iran. But God moved in the heart of their king, Cyrus, and Cyrus allows the Jewish people to return and rebuild their homeland. But Israel needs a high priest. Israel needs a high priest to lead them. And back then, the high priest was the one who stood before God and represented the people. And Joshua becomes the first high priest as the people return to Israel. So in our story, Joshua is representing the people who had sinned so badly 
that God banished them in the first place, now they get a chance to go back. I don't know how Joshua would feel in this role because there hadn't even been a high priest in his lifetime. In almost two generations. Zechariah, this is what the prophet says about that calling. Then God showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua is standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who are standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge on my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. What a scene! What, every time I read this, I get chills because this is the perfect description of what Jesus does for us. It's the best description of what it means to be justified. God has removed our filthy clothes of sin. He's dressed us cleanly in royal robes, and he's rebuked Satan's claim on our life. And when Romans says we are justified, that is what being justified means. Not just forgiven, but as if I had never sinned. And that leads us to the last attribute of being chosen. Romans also says you are glorified. Now, this one sounds the best, but I also think it's the one that's the hardest to define because what does being glorified mean? Well, simply put, if you glorify something or you glorify someone to an extreme degree, it's, it means it, that you like someone, maybe you might compliment them, you might praise them, but glorifying them takes it a whole step further. When something is glorified, it's praised to the highest degree possible. The Bible says that you are not just merely saved, but that you're glorified. That means you are elevated to a position of royalty. You know, we looked at this a few weeks ago. As an adopted child of God, you enter into the royal family, co-heirs with Christ. Now, in my opinion, the number one reason that Christians don't live up to their God-given potential is that we don't live up to glory. We don't want to accept it. You know, we, we, we think we're too humble and we hide from it. And, I, and I'll be honest, I'll include myself in this. I don't like attention. I don't want that position. I would just rather lay down and worship Jesus. But that is not what he has called us to do. We are to walk in the glory of Christ and to allow it to shine through us, to show the fallen world the way home. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called, into, called according to his purpose. Friends, you can be secure in knowing that God is working out all things for good because he called you, and you respond to that call by loving him. And the kingdom of God then advances through you. But wait, there's more. Aside from all these attributes of being chosen, there are also promises of being chosen. Let's read a couple of those promises. Verse 37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the very first promise? You are more than a conqueror. What's a conqueror? Well, typically a conqueror is somebody who faces a threat, fights that threat, and then defeats that threat. So you'd think of Alexander the Great, or Charlemagne, or Napoleon. But the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror. You are a transformer of lives. You are a glorifier of God. A conqueror defeats their enemy. The children of God turn their enemies into friends. 
For the Christian, it's not about using force to crush your enemy. It's about using love, even to the point of suffering, even to the point of loss, just in order to celebrate them, to elevate them, to save them. That's why Paul makes this earlier statement in verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Jesus did not come to force people to worship him. He didn't call the legions of angels to save him or to force humanity to bow down to him. Instead, Jesus came as a servant. He came to show us the way. In Mark 10, Jesus calls them and says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the Christian, the only thing we conquer is darkness. And that happens through humility and modeling Jesus to the world. The second promise we have of being chosen is you are secure. Earlier we talked about God's plan to save us, but there's another side to that, and it has to do with how we stay saved. Now a Calvinist would say that once you accept Christ, you are eternally secure no matter what. You could rebel and sin as much as you want, and you're still saved. An Armenian would say, stay holy or else you could lose your salvation. So how do we understand this verse that seems to say we are eternally secure? But there are others that say, be watchful, be mindful, be obedient, be busy. Free will. The answer comes back to free will. God does not take away your free will once you are saved. From God's perspective, once you're saved, your name is written in the book of life, and it's there forever. Unless you choose to walk away. Free will says you have a choice. You are indeed eternally secure if you accept Christ. Unless you choose to walk away, salvation is not an on-again, off-again situation. Not everyone is gonna be on fire for God 24-7, 365 days a year. We, we often go into this kind of coasting mode where we're not paying attention to our faith. But the good news is that God is always working behind the scenes and he's continuing to disciple you, continuing to grow you and shape you into the son or daughter of God that he wants you to be. The Bible says that if you are willing on your end, nothing in all of the earth or in heaven will be able to separate you from God. Nothing. Ephesians 1.4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. You remember when you were a child and you played those schoolyard games, whether it was dodgeball or Red Rover, Red Rover, or flag football or hide and seek. There were a time when a line was drawn and teams were chosen and you waited patiently for someone to call your name. Now, it could have been that you were a good player or a bad player or popular or unpopular. And that decided whether you were chosen first or last. The Bible says you are chosen first. It's not a matter of us choosing God, but rather it's God who chose us. This is a reoccurring theme in the Bible. It's a fundamental aspect of our faith. It's not about our worthiness. It's not about our righteousness. It's not about our good deeds. It's about God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love. God has created you, and you are special to him. So, rise up, O oh, you sons and daughters of God. You who are justified and glorified you who were chosen before time began. 
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you saw us and chose us before the creation of the world, before we did one right thing, before we did one wrong thing, you wrote our names in the book of life. And we thank you. There's no way we can thank you enough. There's no way we can pay you back. Your grace and mercy are overwhelming. May we each day learn to live and love and serve you the best we can, to overcome darkness, to defeat the enemy, and to turn friend from foe. We pray for conflict. We pray for distress. We pray wherever there is division, because that is not your will. Your will is that all your children would love each other, and that in our efforts we would love you, and that we would spend our days glorifying you and singing your praise. Continue to work out our salvation in us. Continue to grow us and keep us close. Inspire us to serve you and to love this world. And we ask all of it in your son's name. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, starting next week, we'll be having our Thanksgiving services and then our Christmas services, and we would love to have you here worshiping with us. Please come and be a part of your local body of Christ. Wherever your local church is, please seek that community out. No matter how big or small, be a part of God's family. This is where God wants you to be. God created you to be in community because God lives in community. We cannot be a part of the body of Christ if we are alone. Seek out your local church. Seek out that local body and serve it. Serve it because you serve the kingdom. Serve it because you serve Jesus. Now, if you're in Walden, if you're in Montgomery, Texas, we have two services, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We're gonna have a choir, we're gonna sing hymns. It's gonna feel just like the church that you grew up in. Or you can come at 11 o'clock. We have a contemporary service, we have a worship team, and we have a full program from children, for children, birth through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. I love you guys. See you next week.